the passage is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to you, remembering you in all my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Thanks, Alex. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to see you. And uh, really good to get started with our Monday night meetings. So this we've never done this before. Uh, usually we just start on Monday of week one, but we thought let's, let's begin a couple of weeks early. Let's get used to meeting together and get started with it. And hopefully by the time uh, everyone arrives in week one, we are into our rhythm and we're good at welcoming people and we've just we've remembered what it's all about because we've all been away for three months and have forgotten everything. So uh, we're continuing our Gear Up conference as well in some sense, that is keeping looking at the book of Ephesians, which we were doing this morning. And so continuing with Gear Up, but also getting started with Monday nights. And uh, one of the things we're going to be thinking a lot about this year is community. We think it's a theme that's important and uh, obviously an important theme in the Christian life, an important theme in the scriptures, but also just something important to speak to the university about as well. And so when we talk about community, we have lots of particular and important things in mind. And so as we read Ephesians these next couple of weeks, we're going to explore that and think about that a bit more. I hope it will help you as we launch into the year to just have a sense, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what we're on about. This is what Christian faith is about. This is what church is about. And, you know, you feel excited and enthusiastic about getting in, in things together. So let's look at the passage where Paul really is just uh, talking to them about his prayers about them, talking to the Ephesian church about his, the way that he's been praying. And he says, first of all, that he has been giving thanks uh, uh, for some particular things about them. Verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So he's heard about them, he's heard about what's been going on for them, and that uh, makes him thank God for them. And I think as we hear the things that he's praying about, it's a good opportunity to do a bit of a spiritual checkup. Uh, to just step back and think about our lives and go, okay, this is what he says about these believers. Are those things true of me? Are those things true of me? And he points out two particular things that he has heard about them that he's thanking God for. Now, first of all, their faith in the Lord Jesus. And let's just remember what faith is about. Uh, faith is, first of all, it's about believing certain things uh, about Jesus, but then it's about trusting Jesus personally as well. So in the start of the letter in, that we read this morning in chapter 1, Paul has talked about the things that God has done in Christ for us, that he chose us in Christ, he adopted us in Christ, he showed us grace in Christ, he redeemed us in Christ, brought us forgiveness through Jesus' blood, that is, through Jesus' death as a sacrifice. And so all these things are what God has done for us 
in Jesus. So faith is partly saying, yes, that I believe that that's true. I believe that that's true about Jesus. That that's what God has done for us in Jesus. But it's not just saying that certain things are true. It's also then taking a further step and saying, and therefore, I personally put my trust in Jesus. I now rely on him completely in my life. I have no future apart from Jesus. He is the, the total key to who I am and what my future is. That's personal trust. Not just believing certain things are true, but actually personally then uh, relying on you, putting your trust in him. That's what faith towards Jesus means. So the first point of the spiritual checkup would just be, do I have that kind of faith? The kind of faith that Paul thanks God for here. Do I believe these things about Jesus? Do I trust in him? And the second thing is connected to that, and that is the, their love towards all God's people. Literally, their love towards God's holy ones. So, of course, Jesus taught that the primary thing about being one of his followers is that you love the other followers. You love the brothers and sisters. This is how you show that you belong to Jesus. This is how people will know that we are Christians. Uh, this is what the law was all about, Jesus teaches. And this is Jesus' own example, an example of love which is self-giving and self-sacrificial. To be a follower of Jesus is to love his people. So that's the second aspect of the spiritual checkup. Do you, do I love God's people? So look, it just may be that over the summer you have kind of, I don't know what kind of summer you've had and where you are spiritually, but it's possible, of course, to kind of get lost over the summer, to get spiritually, you know, to lose your spiritual bearings. Or at least to just get, you know, kind of woolly and fuzzy and, you know, you're not really clear. You know, in November I was really clear when I was here at Melbourne Uni and in CU, I was clear. Or when, you know, when I finished school I was clear but now I've got, you know, I've gotten off the track. Now's the time to sort of refocus and say, okay, what's it about? Faith towards Jesus and love towards the people who belong to Jesus. That's the, that's the essence of it. How are you going with that? Maybe you might just tick both of those off and say, yep, going okay with those four. Not so much. I need to get refocused. I need to get back on track. And then what Paul does is, uh, having given thanks, or said he's given, giving thanks for them, he also tells them how he has prayed, what he's praying for them. And this is what he says. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Okay, now here's Paul's prayer and it just, it all spills out. Our translators have divided it up into separate sentences for us, but actually it's just one, once again, one long sentence and you can probably work out how it joins up. Uh, but here's the question. He, he prays for the Spirit. Uh, he prays for the Spirit to be with them. The Spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now what Paul's doing here is he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, but he's talking about the Holy Spirit in terms of a particular aspect of the Spirit's work. So when he talks like this, uh, you're not meant to think that there is, uh, you know, there's all kinds of spirits, and one kind of spirit is a spirit of wisdom and revelation, and Paul is praying for that spirit to be in the lives of the people he's praying for. Uh, like our, our translators have given the spirit there a capital S, and I think that's right. It's a way of referring to the Holy Spirit. But sometimes in the Bible, the spirit is referred to in terms of the different kinds of things that the spirit does. And famously in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. So let me read this to you. Isaiah 11, verse 2. Uh, and it's a passage we often hear read out at Christmas time. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, 
and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Uh, and as Jewish people reflected on that passage, they said, well, that's the, the Spirit of God has seven, seven things that the Spirit does, or the seven things that the Spirit is. Did you hear them? There's, the Spirit is the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit is the Spirit of wisdom, and the Spirit of understanding, that's three. And the Spirit of counsel, four. The Spirit of might, that's five. The Spirit of knowledge, six. And the, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord, seven. So if I was to pray for you that you might have a spirit of might, let's say, or a spirit of the fear of the Lord, I'm not praying for you know, just some random spirit. I'm actually praying that the Holy Spirit will help you in that particular way. Does that make sense? That's why I think in the book of Revelation, uh, as John has his vision, he talks about the seven spirits of God. And you're kind of reading it and going, what? What's, what's that? What is that? What are the seven spirits of God? Well, I think he's, he's talking about the Holy Spirit in these different ways that the Spirit works. The sevenfold Spirit of God. The perfect Spirit of God that works in different ways in, in our lives to bring us to perfection. Okay, so he highlights the Spirit's role in bringing wisdom and revelation. To know things. The Spirit helps you to know stuff. So, what does the Spirit help us to know? Could you talk to the person next to you? Have a look at the passage again, uh, verses 17 to the first part of verse 19. What What does the Spirit help us to know? Talk about that with the person next to you. Okay. Thank you for doing that. What did you find? What? Does the Spirit, what does Paul pray that the Spirit will help them to know? Yeah. Um, can we provide an answer and then ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. So this is the first week of the year so, and we're feeling all just mellow. Why not? So one of them is the riches of his glorious inheritance. And the question is, it's, it follows up with that by saying, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Yeah. So we were wondering, does that mean the holy people are the inheritance, or we're the inheritors, or are we both? Yeah, so I think among, you could say among his holy people, or that's, that's the inheritance that you get because you're part of that people. Yeah. Okay, so the glorious inheritance, and what's the, what is the word he used before that, uh, to the, the thing that they need, that he prays that they might know? Um, the hope. Hope, yes. Okay, so the inheritance is a hope. Uh, hope for the future. Yeah. And what else? What else does he pray that the Spirit will help them to know? Yeah. God himself? Yes, to actually know God. So to, to know the God who is... the God the Father who sends his Son and pours out his Spirit. Yes? Yeah? If there's not involved God, can I say yes? I know about Jesus as well. Because Jesus is God. Yeah. So notice the passage is very Trinitarian, right? The, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, very clearly the way Paul understands the faith. Yes? Okay. What else does he pray that they'll be able to know through the Spirit's work? The power. The power of God. What kind of power is it? What kind of power? It's great power. Yes, and what has God done with this power in the past? He raised Jesus from the dead. He raised Jesus. So... First of all, uh, well, second of all, he wants them to uh, know the power of God. That the Spirit will help them know God's power in their lives. And that this power is the same power that 
God put to work in raising Jesus from the dead. It's resurrection power. It's the power of new life. The power of regeneration and newness. And this is the, this is the power that he wants them to know in their lives as well. And this is, I think it's exciting. It means that the gospel message, when it speaks of Jesus raised from the dead, it connects to us in lots of ways, but including this way, that that same power we are able to experience as well by through the Spirit. And that that power is at work among God's people and changing God's people and bringing people to faith and all of the things that uh, we long to see God do in the world. It's possible because of his power. Now, we, at the end of last year, we had a series on power, if you were here, and we finished up just with this idea, the Spirit's power in our lives. And it's this power that is experienced in weakness. It's just good to remember that that experience of the Spirit's power particularly happens when we are unable to do something and only God can do something. And uh, this is good news for us because we have a mission on campus that is just actually impossible for us. But uh, the, Spirit, the Spirit's power uh, can be experienced in our weakness, our inability to make things happen, to change people's hearts, to bring them from death to life spiritually. But as we seek to go about the mission, we can experience God's power. And we can pray, actually, that God's power will be known among us. It's just interesting that he says that you need help to know this, that I need help to know this. That is, that there are certain things spiritually that we just struggle to grasp. And one of them is how much God can do. How much God could do in our lives, how much God could do through us. We need enlightenment to be able to grasp that. We need to be able to see something inwardly. That's why he uses that really weird image of the eyes of your heart. That is, to really grasp something at the core of who you are. I'm, you know, God's Spirit is helping me see how much God can do for us and how much God will do for us. Yeah, the Spirit's power. And so the, the other thing that he prays about for them is connected to that, to know the hope that uh, he has called them to and the extraordinary inheritance that they have in the future. And Paul has already talked about this earlier in the chapter and we'll return to it again here. The picture that we saw this morning of all things gathered together in Jesus. Everything brought together under the rule of Jesus Christ. Everything set right, everything put in its proper order under Jesus the King. That's the extraordinary hope for the future. Uh, and he will talk a bit more about that. We'll see that in a minute. But that is uh, a huge hope. That is a huge hope. And it's actually not something that you can grasp easily. Not something that I can grasp easily. Will it really be the case that sometime in the future, the whole world, the whole universe will be under the rule of Jesus in a way that fixes everything that gets rid of every cause of suffering that gets rid of every form of evil could that could it really be the case that's not easy to believe is it you need spiritual help i need spiritual help to really grasp the fullness of the hope and it's probably fair to say that a lot of the time the church doesn't really grasp that hope in its fullness we shrink it down in various ways. Uh, we struggle to really believe that that is what God is going to do. But just as we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead by the same power, God will make all things new. That Jesus is just the very first little bit of the, the future, if I could put it crudely. The human being Jesus who is now alive forever, is the beginning of the future. And we need help, we need the Spirit's help to believe that. So this is what he, that's what, what he prays for them, 
the Spirit's power to know these things. I think that that is uh, incredibly important for us to grasp that hope for the future. Because what it does is, first of all, it stops you putting your hope in other things. If you can grasp the real hope, then it will stop you putting your hope in things that will not satisfy, in things that will not come through for you in the end, uh, which is what human beings tend to do. That's what idolatry is about. It's putting our hope in things that are less than God and less than God's future. So to grasp the hope actually guards us from false worship. But also, grasping the hope means that we are able to endure all the difficulties and the struggles and the pain and the, all the problems of this life. And, you know, if you get involved in Christian ministry and you get involved in Christian union, then it could be that your pain and your struggles and your difficulties are only increased. Isn't that right? Actually, you work, you're working even harder than you would have if you hadn't been a Christian and you hadn't been serving here at you. So how are you going to keep going through all of that? Well, you need the hope, the, the big hope that Paul talks about here. Now, I recently got to see just the most fantastic film. Uh, this was one of the total highlights of my summer. And uh, I think we're going, to, we're going to see a movie poster called Hidden Life, uh, written and directed by Terence Malick. And look, this is not necessarily a film I want you to go out and see, although you could go and see it tonight at the Nova if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's quite a difficult film to watch. Uh, but it was, it was so totally exciting to see this work of art which is just so distinctly Christian. I, would, that's, I, I find it hard to find the right words for this. But it, this doesn't happen very often, does it? And, you know, there are sort of cheesy Christian films, which are, and that's good that people are making those, uh, but there are very few kind of real works of art, cinematic experiences that are profoundly spiritual uh, from a Christian direction. This is, that's what this is. Um, and uh, can I tell you a bit of what it's about? Can I spoil it? Oh, yeah. Is anyone here going to go see it tonight? <laughs> and, I think Andy is. No, he's not. Oh, who knows? Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a true story uh, about this guy, uh, an Austrian farmer, uh, and uh, his name was Franz Jägerstatter. And uh, he, this, the story is set in the 19, late, late 1930s and in the 1940s. In 1938, you may remember from history, uh, Germany took over Austria, integrated it into the Third Reich, Nazified it, and uh, and so we. The movie just begins with that, and uh, Austria becoming Nazi, and we get to see Franz's life. He's married to Franziska, his wife, Anna. And uh, they have three little daughters. They work on the farm up on the, in the Austrian Alps. And we just get lots and lots of, of them living their normal farmy life up there in the mountains uh, with just the threat, the gradual threat of the war hanging over them. And uh, we, we see the way they work. We see all the things that they do on the farm. We see their community. We hear a little bit about their story. And it's all, this whole thing just is very slow. It just takes its time showing you all this stuff. Not a lot of words, uh, a lot of images. And then uh, Franz gets called up to do his army training. And so they're separated from each other and they can only write letters to each other. And we hear the, the letters that they write to and from each other. So quite lovely. Uh, they address each other as husband and wife. Husband, she writes, and so on. And um, there, there's just this sense of their separation. We see them living apart from each other. And he's obviously he's miserable in doing the army training. Uh, and the only bright thing is that he makes a friend in the, in the, in the uh, boot camp called uh, Voldlin. And this guy Voldlin is just a wacky guy. He doesn't take the training seriously at all. He, he's a total weirdo but he becomes a friend with friends. 
but then they get, uh, they get sent back home. Uh, they don't have to go into the army. Uh, for, for a time, he's allowed to go back and be a farmer again. And so there's this time of reprieve where he's back on the farm and not the family are together again. But he knows that any time he might get called up to join the army. And when he joins the army, he will have to swear an oath of allegiance. Not to Germany, but personally to Adolf Hitler. And he's thinking, can I do that? And we get to hear some of his talk, uh, talking with people around at his church. Someone tells him that Hitler is the Antichrist. Okay, he's starting to think, can I pledge loyalty to the Antichrist? He's talking to people, he's asking what they think, they're giving him advice. Every day the mailman comes riding past on a bicycle and passes by their house. Every day brings the fear that the letter might come, that he's going to be called up into the army. And then eventually one day the postman stops and gives him a letter and he has to go into the army. Uh, he talks to his priest about what he should do. He talks to the bishop about what he should do. Um, eventually he, go, he reports for duty and they, have, they take the oath and he refuses to take the oath. And he's put immediately into the uh, barracks prison. And uh, he's there in the, in the prison and they're, they're saying, to him, why are you doing this? What, what, you know, what do you think you're doing? No one's going to care. No one's going to notice. Uh, why, why are you doing this? And eventually he gets transferred to a proper prison in Germany. And this is where the movie just starts to drag out. Like it's just incredibly long and repetitive. And, but this is part of the point. Uh, that being in the prison is a nightmare. He gets beaten up and persecuted by the guards. He's not allowed to talk to the other prisoners hardly. Uh, and there's this constant temptation. His lawyer, the priest, um, the army officers who come to see him, all saying to him, why don't you sign, why don't you sign the oath? It's not, a, it's not a big deal. The priest tells him, look, it's really... It's really more about what, you are, what you're like on the inside. It doesn't really matter so much what you do. Uh, the army officers say, Don't, you, know, you know this is not going to make any difference at all. And what about your family? And the lawyer's saying, look, just sign the piece of paper and you'll be okay. And this just goes on and on. He's having this miserable time in prison and he's constantly being urged to sign the paper. All he's got really are just the letters from his wife uh, and encouraging him uh, to keep going. And uh, this just drags on for so long, it just, you almost feel like I just wish they would execute him. It's so, <laughs> it's just so relentless, the temptation uh, that he faces. Can he keep going or is he going to give up? Uh, and in the middle of all this misery, the, the greatest thing happens is that his friend, Waldman, turns up in the prison. And it's like total relief. It's almost like you could almost get up at that point and say, Waldman, thank God you're here. This is so great. Because he's just such an optimistic friend. And the thing that he says uh, to Franz is, he doesn't give him any false hope, doesn't say anything, you know, it's you'll get out of this or something like this. What he does is say, he, tell, he says to him, what, what's going to happen is they're going to separate your head from your shoulders and you'll be set free. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a friendly message. He said, he said and we, he's going to, and in the future, we will we'll be on the farm together and we'll, we're going to make wine, you and I. We'll make red wine for the winter and white wine for the summer and we'll you know, and he says and we'll, sometimes we'll go to church and sometimes we won't <laughs> which I just think is so fantastic so in his wacky way this man is giving him oh, he, the, what, he, what he's talking about is a new creation where things are the way that they're meant to be 
And this is the thing that helps him to keep going. This is the hope that he has. And I just think this is, this is just so help, so insightful. I think lots of people, reading reviews of this, I think there are lots of people who didn't really get it. But what, what was happening was he was someone struggling to keep going and then there were just a couple of, a few things that, helped, that gave him hope. And the hope helped him to keep going and do the right thing, right to the end. And that, that, was, that was amazing. Uh, the, the, and at the end of the movie, like Beck and I were sitting in the cinema, there's still quite a few people in there. And she says, I cannot believe that we just watched that movie with these people. Like, it was like, how is it possible that someone could create such a profoundly Christian work of art that just ordinary people want to come and see? Um, that, was, that was very exciting. But I thought, yeah, there's a, there's a profound meditation on what hope, the importance of hope and what hope can do for you in terms of facing the most difficult uh, struggles that Christian faith leads you to in your life. So that, that is, the Paul says, is the work that the spirit, uh, the spirit of wisdom and revelation can bring into your life, that you actually have that kind of hope for the future, the hope that sustains you through these things. Okay, so what happens here is that Paul, now just to finish up, he, as he starts talking about Jesus, uh, he gets carried away, I think. And uh, it just, it stops being an account of his prayers for them and just becomes all about how incredible Jesus is. Look at what he says here. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. So here is the grand vision that uh, Paul finishes up with, and it's a bit hard to grasp. The clearest thing is that, that Jesus uh, has now been raised to be over all things. He's the head, the authority over everything. And that everything else in the universe, whatever powers there might be, whether they're human powers or spiritual powers, are now under Jesus. Way under Jesus. He's way above them. And that this is true not just for this present age, but also for the one to come. So here the attention starts to shift towards the future, God's future, once again. And it's, he says that uh, Jesus is head over everything, rules over everything. Everything is under Jesus' feet for the church. This is the most extraordinary thing for Paul to say. That Jesus rules for the church. He, he actually rules for us. And this is, this is extraordinary, wonderful news that uh, Jesus... Not just that Jesus rules, but that his rule is exercised on our behalf into the future, on behalf of his people. And so what that means is there is no need to be afraid. There's no need for us to be afraid. Uh, in Ephesus, there were lots of rulers and powers. There was the rule of Artemis, the goddess, there was the rule of Rome. There were all these things that the Christians might be scared of because they were so small and so insignificant. But Jesus rules over all things for the church. And he says that uh, the church has a future with Jesus. It says the church is his body, verse 23, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, this is, this is just getting so kind of cosmic that it's really hard to grasp, I think, just what he's saying here. But that, first of all, he pictures Jesus, or sorry, he pictures Christ as 
being composed of Jesus and Jesus' people. Okay, this is a weird picture, but imagine a giant body, and there's a head, and that's Jesus, and then there's a body, and that is the church. And all together, that forms one person called Messiah, called Christ. Does that make any kind of this is some kind of spiritual cosmic reality that exists already, but which in the future will become, uh, well, he says, will fill everything in every way. It sounds pretty comprehensive. Fill everything in every way. So what is the future that Paul has in mind here? That somehow in the future, Jesus and his people will fill everything. That the universe and the church will be, is this the right word? Co-extensive. Is that a word? Someone help me. Does anyone do maths? Does anyone do maths? Jesus and Jesus church and the universe will be coextensive. That is, in the future, you will not be able to go to church because church will be everywhere. Is that right? The whole thing will be, the universe will be the church. The universe will be God's temple. Now, I reckon, surely you need the Spirit's help to grasp that. And so do I. I it, that is unimaginable. But actually, really what it's saying is that's just getting back to God's original plan in Genesis 1, that the world be filled with the image of God. The world be filled with people who are the image of God. And to say that, the, the church, that Jesus and his people will fill the whole is to say that 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 original vision of Genesis will be fulfilled. That with God it's not a plan B, it's back to plan A. It's it's getting plan A done. And that's exciting. So look, I think uh, this means uh, that we we have this amazing, wonderful vision of the future where everything is brought together under Christ, where uh, Christ and his church fill all things And therefore, we should try to talk about the future in bigger terms than we normally do. This is one of the challenges, I think, that we we have to take on. Uh, And I'm going to say this. I think we should stop talking about heaven, because the Bible doesn't much at all, maybe. I mean, if you can find it in there, you can show me. But there's, there's not a whole lot of about talking about our future as heaven. What there is, is lots about a new creation, the kingdom of God, and everything coming under the rule of Jesus. And that's how we should talk about it. That's how we should think about it among ourselves. And that's how even we should start talking about it with people around us. But we'll need the Spirit's power to do that. Okay. So if Jesus is uh, head over everything, let me just suggest to you that that means he is head over your life in every aspect. Your years and months and days and weeks and hours and minutes and seconds. Your past and present and future, your degree, your work, your diary, your bank account, your possessions, your family, your friendships, your relationships, your hopes and dreams and plans. If Jesus is Lord over all of them, then... Belonging to him means saying yes to that. And let me suggest secondly that, uh, well, let me ask you this question. Is Melbourne University part of all things? Yes. So, therefore, (laughs) Jesus is is Lord of Melbourne Uni. He's the Lord of every faculty and school. He's the Lord of every lecture theatre and classroom and teaching space and lab and union house and... (laughs) Every cafe and every person and every power and authority that's here, every course and every subject, every conversation and interaction and transaction and disagreement. And therefore, we mustn't, we mustn't be afraid to be Jesus' people here. And that's what I mean by a, power, a community of power and hope. A community of power and hope is what we want to be, where we actually know the Spirit's power the resurrection power among us 
and where we know the hope that he's called us to, this glorious inheritance. And those are the two other items on the checklist. Spiritual health checkup. Faith in Jesus, love towards the saints, hope in that eternal future, and the experience of the Spirit's power now and in the future. I hope that you can tick those things off now, but I more than that want to say we should pray that we become people like that and a community like that in our lives. Paul says this is his prayer. We can pray this way for each other. Will we give thanks for each other? Will we pray for each other to be people of hope and power? Well, I'm going to do that now. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for uh, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for giving us faith in him. We pray that each person here might have strong faith in the Lord Jesus, strong personal trust in him. Please, by the power of your spirit, help us to love each other and to love your people around the world. Please, by the power of your Holy Spirit, give us this great hope for the future. Help us to grasp how magnificent, how huge, how wonderful this hope is. And we ask in your mercy, by your spirit, that we might know your power in our lives, the resurrection power that brings new life to every person in every place. Uh, Please help us not to work under our own strength, but to seek your power in all things, your power to change lives and bring new beginnings. Help us to be a group that is full of that hope and that power. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.